the Joe Rogan experience. Um, there was another thing that was deceptive, or at least it, it confused people. That's when they made them eat a bean burrito and they checked their blood. Oh, the and then they made blood. them, yeah, the they cloudy had cloudy blood. blood. <laughs> okay. That's. That was, I was just sitting there shaking my head going, what in the fuck are you doing? This has nothing to do with health. So again, not a peer-reviewed experiment, something that was, or controlled study in any way, just something that they did in the film. Um, So yeah, they they fed the burritos, you know, with meat, without meat, and they measured their blood afterwards. Big surprise if the people who ate meat, which has more fat and more saturated fat, had cloudier blood. Well, that's normal. That's just naturally what you would expect from yes. the process of eating feet. You as, will temporarily have more fat in your blood. It has nothing to do with health. So what is the right. big question? It might actually so be better for what? you. might be better for you. And so then I went and I, I thought, okay, well, what does the peer-reviewed research show about animal protein and endothelial function? Because their claim was that eating the animal protein reduces your endothelial function and, and in, increases inflammation. So um, this, I, there, there was one um, study that a lot of the, there are a couple studies that show a low carb diet impairs endothelial function, but they tend to be short term, like four weeks. I, I look for longer term studies. There was a 2009 study that followed subjects for 12 weeks, and they found the low-carb diet actually improved endothelial function, whereas a low-fat diet decreased it. And then there was a 2007 study that followed subjects for a year, and there was no change in endothelial function on a low-carb diet. We actually, there's strong evidence that high blood sugar and insulin resistance impair endothelial function. So, you know, a low carb diet that would lower your blood sugar and improve insulin resistance would be expected to improve it from that perspective. So again, when you look at the actual science, the actual peer reviewed research, you don't see that relationship that they're talking about. They didn't even, I mean, when they're showing it to you, it's just scare tactics. They're yeah. not, they're not talking about what that means. What persuasive, yes. you know, people see it and they're exactly. like, oh my God, the blood right. is cloud. Even the football players right. who were in the experiment, they were, yes. they were like, oh wow, I'm not going to eat my KFC or Popeye's anymore. And I'm like, well, you probably shouldn't, but it's not for that reason. <laughs> right. You know? Well, saturated fat is the demon, right, that, yeah. that, that keeps getting addressed. Explain why saturated fat is not only healthy, but probably necessary. Well, I don't know that it's necessary, but I would, I would say that, you know. Well, I should say cholesterol is necessary. Yeah. Well, cholesterol is necessary, um, and our body makes it, too. You know, actually, most of the cholesterol that we have in our body, we manufacture, uh, it doesn't come from the diet. About 30% comes from the diet. About 70% we, we make. It, the exact ratio varies depending on the person. And, you know, some people are hyper responders of dietary cholesterol, so they'll absorb more from food. But it's, you know, it, it plays a vital role in the body. There's a, a genetic disease called smith lemley opitz syndrome, which results in severe cholesterol deficiency, and it's it's fatal. So... You die with not enough cholesterol. I'm not, however, one of these people on the other end of the spectrum that thinks, hey, if your cholesterol is 450, don't worry. No problem. There's, you know, like, you know, just write it off. I think the truth is somewhere in the middle. And it's biological variable. Right? It's variable. Yeah. yeah and, it, and, and the, you know, person. you can get, I, and I see this, at, you know, I've been working with patients for, o- for over 10 years. I test every single person that comes through the door with a full lipid panel. And I have people who are, doing keto, super low carb diets who have totally optimal normal cholesterol. And then I have people who go from eating, you know, a a low moderate fat diet to like a high fat keto or low carb diet. And their LDLP goes up to 2,500 or 3,000 and their LDL cholesterol goes up to 300. Mm. So, yeah, I mean, what I can, I think what stepping back a little bit, as we talked about this with Joel, but cholesterol for decades was look it was, it was the boogeyman. You know, you sh- it was like that led to like egg white omelets and boneless, skinless chicken breast, and you mm-hmm. know, bagels with nothing on them. <laughs> like right. When I was growing up, and now even the and margarine, margarine. Oh my yeah. god! I uh, can't that, believe it's not butter. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> they thought it was better than butter. <laughs> Hilarious. Which like rats won't even eat if you leave it out in the <laughs> the garage. Really? But, yeah. Um, really? Yeah. So rats uh, eat batteries. 
They won't eat margarine? <laughs> That's what I've heard. I've never done this we experiment. Need to do an experiment. We should do it. Otherwise, we're <laughs> yeah. pushing out disinformation as well. Propaganda. Um, so, go ahead. So, yeah, you know, the, the U.S. quietly actually removed the limitation of dietary cholesterol. They used to limit it to 300 milligrams. Um, now that they don't have that anymore because the evidence didn't justify having that in the dietary guidelines. We were the last industrialized country to do that. Every mm. other company country had done that years ago. Right. Um, but because, you know, the uh, how entrenched that was in our country, and I think, you know, the, they don't want to lose credibility. It's like they've been saying not to do something for so long, then to turn around and say, actually, right. there's no evidence to support that. It's, 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 you lose face. And when people talk about saturated fat and they talk about it as being only a, uh, a meat or animal uh, d- diet issue, um, p- one thing that I always like to bring up is avocados. Yeah. There's a certain amount of unsaturated fat and saturated well, fat. Every food has all three fats in some proportion. So you have saturated, monounsaturated, and polyunsaturated. And dairy products are actually the only category of foods that consistently have more saturated fat than any other type of fat. Pork, for example, often has more monounsaturated fat than saturated. And even sometimes, really? yeah, lean beef. And what's really interesting about that is that Studies consistently show that full fat dairy, which would be like the highest saturated fat class of foods, is is associated with reduced risk of heart disease, reduced risk of diabetes, reduced weight, and all kinds of other improvements. Full fat dairy is full now, fat is this dairy. Raw dairy, like raw milk. They don't different. You know, it, they're not differentiating like that in the studies. Why do you Just think any so many, full fat dairy? Why do you think so many people are lactose intolerant then? Because it seems that that's an issue, and I think I seem to have it a little bit, and my nine year old daughter definitely has it. Well, so it wasn't until eleven. You know, before eleven thousand years, twelve thousand years ago, we didn't raise animals for dairy, so there was no need that we only had to digest lactose while we were breastfeeding. No, so like in a hunter-gatherer right. culture, as soon as you stop breastfeeding, you no longer had the need to digest lactose. And so we're, our bodies are efficient. We stop producing lactase, which is the enzyme to break down lactose and for the rest of our adult life. But then about 12,000 years ago, we, we started, you know, somebody figured out, hey, let's drink some milk from that ruminant animal over there. And milk dairy products help people avoid starvation and there was a good source of hydration and nutrients. And so that mutation started to spread. And now it's about one third of, of the world has lactase persistence, which means they can digest um, lactose all the way into adulthood and two thirds don't. And it depends mm. a lot on your ancestry. So, so two thirds people are lactose intolerant in the world. To some extent. Wow. That's interesting. So the people who tend to be lactose tolerant are people of European, particularly Northern European descent, like lactase to- lactose tolerance um, or lactase persistence approaches like 97% in Scandinavia. So Denmark, Norway, Sweden, they can almost all digest milk. And then East Africans. So you have like the Maasai, you know, people who've been raising cattle for a long time tend to have those, um, that capability. Whereas like in Asia, other parts of Africa, uh, in other parts of the world, not as much. What difference, if any, does it make when it's not homogenized and pasteurized in terms of your digestion? Because for me, I don't have a problem with raw milk. Yeah. Raw milk seems to be easy for me. Yeah, I think there is a difference. I mean, it contains enzymes in it that help you break down the, lac- the lactose. Um, so that can make a difference. But I mean, just I would love to see research that further differentiates the health benefits of dairy according to whether it's organic or whether it's homogenized or not and all that. But even just talking about dairy as a whole category, I mean, you had Dr. Walter Willett in there saying there's evidence of high high consumption of proteins from dairy is related to higher risk of prostate cancer. The chain of cancer causation seems pretty clear. But if you bring up uh, slide 44, Jamie, this, there was a 2019 study, largest review of dairy ever been done before. It was 153 meta-analyses that they reviewed. So not just individual studies. They reviewed 153 studies that were also reviewing other studies. <laughs> and it, 84% of the meta-analyses on dairy showed either no association or an inverse association between dairy and cancer, meaning when it's inverse, it means people who ate more dairy had lower rates of cancer. Whoa. So 
I just, it, it's frustrating, you know, to, to see someone make a claim like that. And then you go and you look at the full totality of the research and you see a, a just exhaustive study like this with 153 meta-analyses and 84% are showing no relationship or a beneficial effect of dairy on cancer. Why wasn't that mentioned in the film? Well, it's consistent with the way the message is being distributed through the entire film. It's, it's a propaganda movie. I mean, that's essentially what it is. Yeah. Yeah. So it's I mean, like reefer madness for meat. <laughs> I mean, it really is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So uh, it's kind of crazy. 